All right. Um, well, good morning, everyone. We're going to be looking at uh, the true gospel. And we can see what the gospel is. Uh, the, the apostles teach us what it is. Uh, we want to answer a couple questions, though. Um, how do we get the death of Christ to count for us? You know, this is the gospel. Paul says that he declared the gospel, that he preached to them, which they received. They, were, they heard it. They received it. They stood in it. He says, by which you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And he says, what he, what he taught them, for I delivered you, first of all, that which also I received. And it's important to know this, because each one of these apostles received their message from God, what to preach. And uh, something I remember Brother Dub telling us one time, uh, you know, he kind of mentored us, and, and he said that anytime something appears in the New Testament for the first time, that the scriptures will always teach the stated purpose of that doctrine, whether it be repentance or baptism or whatever it is. And so he says here that they uh, that they uh, that he had received it. So for Paul, when he was when he was stopped on the Damascus road, the Lord talked to him and told him about what his assignment would be. He told him some things that that he would be doing, things that he'd be preaching. And so he says that he received that from the Lord. You know, if you might remember, he was rejected by the church and went to Arabia for 15 years. They were all afraid of him and didn't believe he was a disciple. Uh, so here he was an apostle and wrote half the New Testament. And so he says what he's told them, what he taught them, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he rose again according to the Scriptures. So this, that's why the, the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all a record of Jesus' teaching for the church. They were foundational for the church. And that uh, they're the story of His, uh, of his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, so that's why they're called the Gospels. And so the, the stated purpose when Christ arose from the dead, you know, he say, it's the stated purpose of His death, that He would suffer for the sins of others. He had no sins of His own, so He became our Redeemer. And so... The Lord, the Father said, he had, since he had no sins of his own, that his suffering and death could be for those who came to him to be clean, to be cleansed, to be washed from their iniquity. And so he died for our sins. He had no sins of his own. So that's the, the core of the gospel message. And then he was buried and he rose again the third day, God raising him out of the grave because the grave couldn't hold him. He was the Son of God, and He came for this very purpose to redeem us from all iniquity. That's what this is, redemption. Okay, And so what we find out is, is that, is that uh, what John the Baptist was taught was foundational. It, those, those doctrines that he taught would never change. And uh, Paul, being the last apostle that was called, was told to teach the same things John was. And we'll show all that from the Scriptures. Well, we want to know, we, everyone believes this, this is the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. Gospel just means good news. The, the questions we got to ask is, how do we get the death of Christ to count for us? Nobody believes that Christ died on the cross, and so therefore every wicked sinner is going to heaven. Nobody believes that. Okay? Nobody believes whether you follow Jesus or not, and just live in the darkness of the world, that you're saved anyway. So how do you get the death of Christ to count for you, you know? And, uh, and so the second question, was it ever preached without repentance and baptism by any of the apostles? You know, and so today there, there are uh, variations. That's why I call this, this presentation the true gospel. We want to look at the very foundation of the scriptures and see what they say. Uh, people have left the foundation of the scriptures. They want to find a, a verse and isolate it and make Paul against Paul, Paul against Peter, and, and, and so on and so forth. And they just come up with, with new things that just aren't in the Bible, things that were never teached, you know. And so, I mean, I, I actually saw a video one time of a preacher was saying that, that, uh, that Christ died for our sins and he's just kind of just going from person to person saying, well, you received this gift. Well, that's not in the Bible anywhere. And so all you have to do is just receive the gift, and then you're sealed forever, whether you're wicked or not. He was actually teaching that. It sounds just like something Satan would come up with, because all he wanted Adam and Eve to do was disobey God. 
And if you're teaching people the gospel where they can disobey God and it's fine, you're just doing what Satan did in the garden. Because nobody ever taught that in the Bible. Nobody did. And so we're just going to look and see what the scriptures actually say. Okay? So we want to go back to John the Baptist. John preached the baptism of repentance, looking forward to Christ. Now we'll see what he says, the stated purpose. It was called the baptism of repentance. And the stated purpose, like Brother W used to teach us, where it appears in the scriptures first, it was for the remission of sins. You need to know that those people coming to be baptized of John were doing it to be forgiven. That's what it was from the very beginning. And that's what the stated purpose was. And he was looking forward to Christ, okay? And he talks a little bit about this. We want to just go through some of the Gospels and see what they'll say to us about, about what was going on there with John. So John preached the baptism of repentance for forgiveness. Remission just means forgiveness. You can look that up in a Greek lexicon, and it just means forgiveness is what it means. So John preached the baptism of repentance uh, for forgiveness, and he taught that repentance was required. I see that today, today uh, there's these false gospels where repentance is just a work, so you don't have to repent. And it's just, so the gospel, we're talking about a gospel without repentance is what's being preached today. But nobody ever preached that. It's not in the Bible anywhere that that was ever preached. And so we're going to just look and see what they did preach. And so in, in Luke 3, verse 1 and 4, uh, one, well, we'll start in verse 2 here. It says, and in, uh, uh, Annas and, and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now what we need to know is that, is that God came to John and told him his mission. And John talks about that. We'll look at some verses where, he, where John actually says that the one that called him told him some things. So he wasn't just doing what he thought was right. God gave him a specific assignment and told him what to preach. And so he wasn't just going by the Scriptures like we are. And the Scriptures are, are God-breathed. They're all God-breathed. Uh, they're foundational and they're all true. Some of, some of it's just not true. All of it's true. And it's all, it's all, it all will rightly divide. And so the problem with these false gospels is, is, is just, I'm just honestly telling you, you've got people in the world teaching the Word that cannot take one Scripture and compare it to another. They just don't have the gift. And that's the truth. That's what's wrong. They just can't compare one Scripture to another. Well, Jesus said the Scriptures can't be broken. It all has to fit. And it all does fit. It may not fit with your doctrines, but it all fits. We have a great advantage here because um, none of us are on anybody's payroll. None of us are. Nobody fires us if we don't stay within somebody's beliefs. And y'all know we don't say what everybody else says here. We just want to be a true disciple. We want to look at the Bible and understand it for ourselves and teach it. And uh, we have that liberty here. Okay, and that's why, that's why we're here. Because we have that liberty. And so what it says is that he came to, uh, that, uh, that God came to John, and it, the son of Zacharias, and he came into the country about Jordan. And so he, this, he was doing what God told him to do, and he was preaching the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. And like Brother Dub used to tell us, where it appears first in the New Testament, it'll be the, the stated purpose will be, will, will be uh, taught to us. See? And so that, that was the stated purpose. The baptism of repentance was for the remission of sins. So he was telling people they could be forgiven if they, got wa if they repented and got washed. That's what he was teaching. Okay, And as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So that's who he was. He was that prophet. And he was saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So he was saying, and he even began to speak that the Lord was among them. And, uh, and so we'll look at some more of that too. So he was preaching the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins and saying that the Lord was among them. The Messiah had come. Okay, 
And in Luke 3, verse, we're just going to look at Luke first, okay, in, in chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. And then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. Now, we know from other accounts of the gospel, these were the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were coming to be baptized. And he called them a generation of vipers. These were the religious people of the day. He says, O, o generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He was saying, how were you finding out? You know, they had their own prescribed religious thing going on. So he says, how y'all are finding out about coming and being repenting and being washed to be forgiven? You know, who's telling y'all? And so he's saying, who's, who's warned you to flee the wrath to come? And so they were hearing from the people that were out there in the wilderness listening to John. It was, it was bleeding back, and some of them were believing. Okay? So he said, this is what he said. This was his warning to these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. To bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. He's saying, if you come here, you've got to change. That repentance was required. That their behavior had to change to, to, be, to be worthy of a person that was repentant. They needed to be acting like a person that was repentant. Repentance was required. This is what John was sent to teach. Okay? And, and he says, um, Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God was able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And this is basically what God did do. He, when, when, those, when the Jewish... The, a lot of Jews became Christians, but a lot of them just went on being Jewish. And so what happened was the, the, the children of Abraham by faith came into existence. There became a people of God that, that were Jews inwardly. And so he just really just began to call Gentiles the children of Abraham based upon them having the faith like faithful Abraham. And so he was warning them that don't just be trusting in the fact that you have a, a lineage that came from Abraham, that this repentance is that, that God is a God of the heart. He's looking at the heart. And he can call anybody children of Abraham. That's what he was warning them. Because that's the kind of thing they would trust in, see? Their doctrines. Instead of what, uh, what God was warning, true repentance. Okay? And he says in verse 9, And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Now, listen to what he's saying. This is a further warning. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast in the fire. He's saying that true repentance is required. If this true, if you're a tree in God's garden, and just a metaphor, and you're not bringing forth good fruit, then your, your, your place, there's an axe laid at the root, it will be chopped down and thrown at the fire. It is not accepted. And you stand there saying, but I received a gift. That's not going to help you. It's not. He requires true repentance. It will be hewed down and cast into the fire. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll look at, continue to look at this foundational teaching and show that it's never changed as we go through the New Testament. It's never changed. These very things are still being taught by the apostles. Okay? Let's look at uh, verse 15 through 17. John warned what would happen to the unrepentant and these unbaptized and unforgiven people. And so in 15 through 17 he says, in verse 15... And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he was the Christ or not, this is what John said to them. I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now that's what happened on Pentecost, is the Holy Ghost. But this fire baptism, that's obviously not, not a good thing. That's everything getting hooed down and cast into the fire. The lake of fire and all of that. And there's some doctrines about there about Holy Ghost fire and all that. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. Because that's not where the context goes. He says in verse 17, whose fan is in his hand, just like the axe. This is another metaphor of, uh, of winnowing wheat. He says that his fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat unto the garner and the chaff will be burned with fire and quenchable. So I think this is the, the baptism of fire that he's talking about. The chaff is the part that's not, that's not fruit. The chaff is the part that was unrepentant, that didn't have good fruit. <coughs> so there was a practice, and people can do that with wind. They don't have to have a fan. 
But they pitch the wheat up into the air, and the chaff is lighter than the wheat. So the wheat will fall short, and the chaff will fall long, and it separates the wheat from the chaff. And he's saying, I'm, I'm separating the fruit from that which is not fruitful. Now, you can't take the chaff and make bread out of it. It's just trash. And so he's separating the unrepentant from the repentant is what he's doing. Repentance and baptism was the means whereby the harvest was attained. That's just the way it was done. And when you look at what he's doing, he was out baptizing them with water for, for forgiveness of sins. And that's how he was separating the forgiven from the unforgiven. That's how it was just being done. He was preaching that Jesus was coming and that uh, they needed to repent and be baptized and they would be forgiven. So that's how they, he was separating the wheat from the chaff. That's how it was being done. The repentance and baptism was a means whereby the harvest was attained as they received forgiveness upon being baptized of him. Now that's just what the scriptures teach us. Okay, And we're going to keep looking at the same things through all four Gospels. This is Mark chapter 1 verse 3 through 5. We want to show that John preached the baptism of repentance in expectation of the coming Savior and in the expectation of the coming Holy Spirit being poured out by the Savior. Okay? And so, uh, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So he's saying the Lord was coming, He's here, make His path straight. And so John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. It's funny how every single one of these authors said the same exact thing. That baptism of this, this whole baptism of repentance was for remission of sins, which, which showed that repentance and baptism were both required. Okay? And so he says, And there they went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So they were doing that. They were confessing their sinfulness before God. And that's a New Testament practice still today. 1 John 1. I mean, that's what we got there in verse 4 through 10, isn't it? If we confess our sins, He's just and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He wants us talking about it, talking to Him about our mistakes. And the Holy Spirit's job, what was it? To convict us of sin. He said when He's come, He'll convict you of sin. What did Ezekiel say that he would do when he got here? He would cause us to walk in his ways and, and cause, ourselves, cause us to loathe ourselves for our own iniquities. That was the prophecy of the Holy Spirit. So he's busy convicting people of their sins. And so that's what they were doing. They were convicted to, at John's preaching. They were coming to be washed and they were confessing their sins in the River Jordan. In verse 7 through 11... Mark 1, he says, and, and he preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me. He's saying, Jesus is coming. The latchet of, of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. That's John saw the heavens open. And the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And there, there came a voice from heaven, and everyone there heard it, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So this was what was witnessed there when Jesus came. He was saying, There's one coming that's mightier than I. And he came, and this is what God testified of Jesus as he was baptized in the Jordan. He's my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. One of the very things that he was uh, convicted of saying when he was crucified, right? They, they said they didn't believe it, so they said it was blasphemy. But God was in heaven saying it aloud for everyone there that witnessed it to hear it, see? Okay? So let's go to Matthew. We want to just look at it again and see they, they're all teaching the same thing, the same true gospel here about the, this forgiveness that Jesus, there was a Savior coming to take away their sins. Even when Jesus was born, the, the angel said that thou shalt call toad Zacharias, thou shalt call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I mean, that's what he was coming to do. That's what his name meant. It meant Savior. God saves. And so in Matthew 21, verse 23 through 25, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching, and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you, ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. And he brings up what John was doing. 
And he says, the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or men? He's, he's asking these Pharisees, was John's baptism from heaven or men? Was it God or was it man's doctrine? Okay? We need to be asking that same question about baptism today. Is it of heaven or men? Because I guarantee you, if John's baptism was of heaven, the apostles' baptism was of heaven. And it's not of men. Okay? And so he says, and they reason with themselves saying, if we say one thing from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe it? So they wouldn't answer. So Jesus wouldn't answer them. And that's the, that, that is how that conversation went. But in 28 through 30 of, John, of, of, of Luke 7, let's look and see what happened there. And he says, For I say unto you, among these that are born of women, there is none greater than the prophet. No, no, not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is at least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. <coughs> and all the people that heard him, that were listening to Jesus, <coughs> all the people that heard Jesus speak, <coughs> And the publicans, these were the tax collectors. They were so detested. They justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But listen what the, the scriptures say. These publicans and harlots and all that that came out, they justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers, they rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And I'm telling you, it's the same today. If you reject the baptism that's from heaven, then you're rejecting the counsel of God against yourself, not being baptized. That's what you're doing. It's not changed. This is what the Scriptures is teaching. That, that, that you know, they justified God. That God had come to save them and did. But these Pharisees, they were rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. So is it, is the baptism of heaven or men? That's a question that people should be asking themselves. Especially those that come up with this new gospel that has neither repentance or baptism. Okay? That's not, that's not anywhere in the Bible. Yeah, the Bible does say that, that's, that eternal life is a gift. But no apostle went around preaching, uh, will you receive the gift today? Will you receive the gift today? No, nobody did that. Okay? It's unscriptural. It is a gift, but they receive the gift through repentance and baptism. And so, uh, this, this, this false gospel, it's just, it's just nonsense. So John preached repentance, baptizing for remission of sins. In Matthew 3, verse 1 and 2, In those days came John preaching and saying, this was his message, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So he's saying that Jesus was coming, he was going to be king of a kingdom. And it was at hand. There was a spiritual kingdom that was about to be revealed. In chapter uh, 3, verse 5 through 8, it says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And when he saw that many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So we said that he would, they would identify those that were coming as Pharisees and Sadducees uh, when we looked at uh, the other account earlier. And so this is what his message to them was. Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. That your repentance needs to be demonstrated by your fruit, by your behavior. It's just a metaphor. okay? And so that's what he was warning them, that their repentance had to be true. Okay? Now, if we go to verse 10 through 12, I want to look and see what more he said. He warned the warning of the unrepentant that they would be rejected. And so he told them in 10, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth, forth, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast in the fire. And I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to, to bear." He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So when we look at this, we can see that, that twice he warns that this, uh, the unrepentant are going in the fire, the chaff is going in the fire, see? 
and that um, that he's going to purge his floor, and it's the repentant that will make up the wheat that is garnered, that is gathered to his garner. They're teaching repentance. That's what they're teaching. That was the, that was the foundational teaching of John. Okay, now, you know, we're going to move into the New Testament in a moment. We want to look at just one more account. We want to look at John. We want to look at John's account of John the Baptist, John the Apostle's account of John the Baptist. So in John uh, 1, verse 29 through 36, we're going to show that John baptized looking forward to the coming Savior. And so the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So he was watching for the Lamb of God that was coming to take away the sin. So God was forgiving them as they were coming to be washed, the baptism of repentance. They were repenting and being washed. But, but it was in view of the Lamb coming to die for their sins. It was in view of, of Him coming. Okay? And so this, this is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, he was, because he was before me. And John was born before Jesus, but he's saying that he was before me because he came from heaven. And uh, I, knew, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So God told him some things that this, that this Savior was going to be made known to Israel. And so he was sent to baptize with water in view of this Lamb of God coming to take away the sins of the world. And John bear records saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. Now we read that already, but I want you to show what, what he says that God said. And I knew him not, but he, that, but he that sent me to baptize. That was God. God that came to him. When we read the, those first verses uh, as we opened up the study, he said God came to him. Okay, And he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. So God, when he called John, he gave him this message. You'll know who the Savior is because the Spirit of God will descend upon him and remain upon him. And he says this will be the one that will be baptizing with the Holy Ghost. Which is what happened in Acts 2 on Pentecost. Okay, And he says, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So he, he knew that this one baptizing with the Holy Ghost would be the Son of God. And that's what God testified when the heavens opened. And looking upon Jesus, as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And so he was, he was announcing that this was the one that he was waiting for. This was the Savior to come, that was coming to take away the sins. So he was baptizing with a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins, looking forward to the coming Savior to arrive on the scene. Okay? Now the apostles taught the same doctrine as John looking backward to the cross because he had already died, got buried, and rose again. And so we're just going to show... From the scriptures, the doctrine didn't change. It just was the same doctrine looking forward to Jesus, and now it's the same doctrine looking backward to Jesus. So this is what we're going to begin to study now. When we saw this, uh, after Jesus suffered, He told the apostles what they would preach. And in Luke 24, verse 45 through 49, when He arose from the dead... It says, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. So the Scriptures are the foundation from which he's teaching them. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. Because we know when he suffered, he, he suffered and died for the sins of those that are coming to him to be redeemed. Okay, So he was teaching them about why he had to die and rise from the dead. And so... The, the, this is the core of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. And so he was opening their mind to that. And then he says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be pre preached in his name. So this is what's changed. It's now in his name. It, the, the forgiveness of sins, that, that was the same as before. What's changed is now baptism is in his name but that this repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So He is telling them that in Jerusalem, your message is going to be repentance and forgiveness, beginning right there in Acts 2, when the Holy Ghost fell from heaven. That's going to be their mission. Repentance and remission of sins. You can't just scratch out that repentance. That's what they came preaching. You can't just call it a work and say, we're not saved by works, you don't have to do that now. 
Jesus said that's what He sent them to preach. Repentance and forgiveness. Okay? That's, and so we'll look at that. And He says, And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. So He says, Tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So they went into Jerusalem and dwelt there until the Holy Spirit fell upon them on that day of Pentecost. Okay? Which was 50 days after Passover. Which Jesus died, was crucified during Passover. Okay? So here it is in Acts. Uh, everything is the same as John taught, except the Holy Spirit is given and baptism is in the name of Jesus. That is the only two things that's different now. And so in Acts 2, verse 22 through 24, it says, Ye men of Israel, hear ye these words, that Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs by which God did by him in the midst of you all, as ye yourselves know. Nobody could deny what Jesus was doing. And he being delivered by, by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. So these were the people involved in his murder. They crucified him and killed him. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Because he was the Son of God, he was coming out of the grave. And then so, verse 36 to 38, he says, as he, as he testified of Jesus being crucified and slain, according to the prophecy, it says, he says, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you have crucified. He is the Lord and He's the Christ that you were waiting for. The Christ of the Scriptures. And when they heard this, they, they were pricked in their heart. They believed the message. And they said, well, what do we do now? They were actually guilty of, of uh, murdering the Messiah. And Peter said to him the same thing that John had been teaching the very foundational teachings that John had been teaching all that three and a half years in the wilderness. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. That's what's changed. In the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins. It's still the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the second thing that changed. Is the Holy Spirit is now moved on the inside to perform nothing different than what Ezekiel said He would do. To convict us of sin and to come inside of us and do a renovation work so that we would become a work of God in progress. That now God is responsible both for our forgiveness and for our development. And the scripture says in Romans 8 that, it was, that God predestined that we should be conformed to the image of His Son. And that that is the work of the Spirit upon the inside of man. And so to cut all that out and to, and to, 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 to eliminate the, plan, the predestined plan of God to conform you into the image. Man, it's just so unscriptural. It's just so unscriptural. It pains me that there are people out there that people will listen to that cannot compare two scriptures. And that's what's wrong. They just cannot put two scriptures up there and compare them. We're following a thread from the very beginning straight through the book of Acts. That's what we're doing today. Showing that this is what it has always been. It still is. It's what they said. It's what they kept saying. Okay? And so he had told her, taught the same thing. This is the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. That's what that is. When he says repent and be baptized, be baptized and repent. It's the same thing. Okay? So... Um, in chapter 19, we want to show the apostles taught a baptism of repentance in the name of Jesus to receive the Holy Ghost. So in, in verse 1 through 5, it came to pass that while that, while apostle was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and he found certain disciples there. And he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. These were actually John's disciples. And then said Paul, John verily, by, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Paul knew what he was doing. And he didn't even believe. He was one of them Pharisees. Born out of due time, he said. And so John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him what should come after him. And that's what he was doing. That's what we've been showing. 
He was baptizing, looking for the Messiah to appear. That is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So yeah, John's counsel was the counsel of God for that time. Well, this is the counsel of God for this time. So they went from being baptized for the remission of sins to being baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Just to receive the Holy Ghost. That's the only thing that they got new. They already had forgiveness of sins. They got the Holy Ghost. He came into their lives to live and to renovate. Okay? Now, did the apostles teach the gospel without repentance? Let's just go back to Acts 26 when Paul talks about what happened to him when Jesus came to him and called him. And just like in the case of uh, uh, God coming to John and he told him to go what to preach? Well... When Paul was called, he was told what to go preach. And so let's just look and see what he says. And I said, Who art thou, O Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which you have seen. That's his testimony. Why he was there upon the ground, listening to Jesus that he didn't believe in. And of those things in which I shall appear unto thee, that God was going to, Jesus was going to be showing him things all along the way. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So he was sending, he had, he had recruited him, he was sending him to preach. And this was his mission, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. That's repentance right there, y'all. You can't stay in darkness and just receive a gift. No, he, he, he wanted their eyes open and the turn, turn is repentance. Turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. You can't stay under the power of Satan and be forgiven and get a gift. That's a, that's a more stupider lie than what Adam and Eve were told. Why would anybody listen to that? Except they just want to keep walking in darkness and believe it's okay. Because they love darkness instead of light, right? So he says, that, he says to turn them from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness. If you want to receive forgiveness, you're going to get out of the darkness and you're going to turn from the power of Satan to God. That's repentance. Then you can have forgiveness of sins. Then you can have the gift. Okay? and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. So here we got faith and repentance being taught. Just like Jesus said when he sent them out in Mark, he that believeth and baptized shall be saved. Faith and repentance. Well, faith is more of a synonym for trust. Belief ain't going to get you in. Faith will. When God brought Israel out of the land of Egypt, he told Moses to bring them to the mountain. And they met God. They didn't have any choice at all whether to believe in Him. And not, not any of them, but Joshua and Caleb went to the land of Canaan. Not one of them. They didn't have any choice but to believe, but that didn't get them in. And we know what the book of Hebrew teaches, that there's a rest remaining for the people of God. You think they're not going to go in that rest because they didn't have any faith, and you are, and you don't have any faith? Belief ain't going to get you in. They didn't have any choice. They went up to a mountain, and if they crossed a rope, they were struck dead, and they listened to a voice that waxed louder and louder, and they were so scared. And there was a thick cloud and darkness and lightning, and this loud voice that the Bible says waxed louder and louder. And as the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, they were afraid. There wasn't a single person there of all the people that came out of Egypt that didn't believe in God. And none of them went to the land of Canaan except Joshua and Caleb. Belief don't get you in. Trusting Him, that's something different. Faith is trust. Say, they didn't trust Him. They didn't trust Him for the provision or the protection or any of the things that he had promised that he would do to get them to the land of Canaan. That's why they didn't go in. So here we show, see faith and repentance being required to get this forgiveness. And so he's talking to Agrippa, whereupon, O king Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, 
But I showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea. He went to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. He said he went to the Jews and to the Gentiles with this message that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Where did we hear that? It is the same exact doctrine, the same God that chose John the Baptist to go out and preach this doctrine, chose Paul, the last apostle, who was persecuting the first apostles, appeared to him in the road and sent him out separately because the church wouldn't receive him. He went to the Jews and they rejected him. And then he went to the Gentiles. But he had this message on his lips. And that same God that called John told this Paul the same message to go preach that he told John. It's not changed. He said that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. The only one that ever said it just like that was John. And you know what he was doing? Repeating exactly what God said. And that's why I said that way. Because they were both called to God and both given the same message. It didn't change. A gospel without repentance is just a false gospel. Repentance is a first principle and it's foundational in the doctrine of Christ. We want to go to the book of Hebrews and we will show repentance is a first principle and foundational in the doctrine of Christ. So in Hebrews 5 verse 11 through 13, he says, Of whom we have many things to say to you that, that are hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. He's saying that it's hard for me to talk to you because you've lost your ability to hear spiritual things. You're dull of hearing is what he's saying. So it's, it's not easy for me to say this to you. But he says, to these people that were in this Hebrew church, these Judeans that was in this Hebrew church, he said the time had come they ought to be teachers, but they need to be taught all over again. And it's not any different today, y'all. People that once believed the true form of the gospel are teaching something else. And they need to go back and learn what they learned in the beginning. That you need, to have, you need one to teach you again what's the first principles. And that's what we want to talk about. What are the first principles? We've been studying them all day. What are the first principles of the oracles of God, the very teachings of God? Because it was God that told John what to say, and it was God that told Paul what to say. What are the first principles of the oracles of God? And he says, you need to be taught again what these are, what these are and you become of those that are like little babies that need milk and need to start over until they can get up to this eating strong meat again. Because everyone that, that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's just a little babe in Christ. And these people went right back to sucking the tit, is what they did. Because they, they don't understand anything that's written in the Scriptures. And so in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, we want to know what these first principles are, and he's going to tell us. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, these are just the first principles. These principles. Let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation. These are foundational first principles, is what these are. And he tells us what they are. Okay? Not laying again the foundation of, this is what the foundation is, repentance from dead works. That's repentance, doing works, meet for repentance. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Same thing, same thing that uh, John and Paul were sent to, to speak. They're all in agreement, y'all. Every one of them's in agreement. The preachers need to get in agreement with them. They're all in agreement with God, Okay? Now we're going to back up and we're going to look at chapter 6 and we just want to show the Scriptures teach repentance is the only way back to those that fall away. They're trying to say repentance is work, you don't have to do it. But the Scriptures say it's the only way back if you fall away. And so we're going to go back to verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go into perfection. He wants to leave them off, but they had to be taught again the first principles. Not laying again this foundation, because this is the foundation. It's a, it's a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. There's some other things in here too. But since this is what they want to flush down the toilet, right out of the Word of God, we're going to, we're going to stay focused on repentance from dead works and faith. But he also mentions baptism here, and the laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. All those are important. They're all foundational. They're all foundational first principles. And we can't dispense of any of those. Unless you want to go to being a baby. Needing milk. Starting over. Learning again what you've, what you've thrown away. 
And he says, and this will do if God permit. He means we'll leave the first principles and go on to, to more important things. And so this is what he begins to talk to us about. For it is impossible. Now this word impossible means deficient in strength and power, infirm, weak, feeble, impossible, unable. So it's not like it's impossible the way we use the word impossible. But it's, it's like if this person falls away, he's too weak to come back because of what he's willing to walk off from. And this is the way he's talking to us. It doesn't say it's impossible for him to be saved either. I just want you to notice that. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, that's those that once knew what all these foundational first principles were, and have tasted the heavenly gift. They've, they've, they've received the Holy Spirit, so they've tasted it. They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Maybe they had some gifts. They were partakers, so they had some spiritual gifts. They've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. It is impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. Now, it doesn't say they can't be saved. It says it's, if they fall away, it's impossible to renew the repentance. And this is what he's saying as evidence of that being true because it's not impossible in the way we are viewing impossible. It's like they're too weak to come back if they walk off from that. And that's what he says. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. They say they basically, they basically enjoyed all these wonderful things. They were enlightened. They, they, they were turned from the power of Satan to God. They, they tasted a heavenly gift and they got gifts from the Holy Spirit. They knew and understood the Word of God and the powers. And then it says they just fell away. If they'll walk off from that, seeing they, then they just stabbed God in the they stabbed Jesus in the back is what they did. They betrayed him and stabbed him in the back, just walking off after he after he did these things for them. Seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. So this is what he's saying. That if you fall away, see, this is this is what the the whole issue is, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. This shows if someone falls away. Their repentance has to be renewed for them to come back. That's what it shows. You know? And so th this is the way back. And that's why I said that if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, that's showing that repentance is what is the way back if you fall away. And all this is doing is just testifying of how hard that may be. Because if they're weak enough to fall, if they're weak enough to fall away, they're too weak to, to repent. Whatever pulled them out in the first place from all these gifts. While they had all these gifts, whatever would pull them out. If, they, if they're too weak, they can't stay in it with these gifts. What's going to be the encouragement to come back? But if they want to come back, it's going to be from renewing their repentance. That's what it's going to be from. Okay? So Jesus taught that a person gone astray is lost and must repent and return. So in this parable, he spake this parable saying... What man of you have a hundred sheep? If he lose one, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost. So this is, a, this is someone that's lost to him, that's left the herd, until he find it. And when he had found it, he laid on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice, I have found my sheep which was lost. This is someone he's lost. They can come back. And I say unto you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. You want to know how this lost sheep gets back? He repents. You want to know why there's joy in heaven? Over one sinner that repents. This is someone that was with the herd, left the herd, now he's back. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. No apostle ever said, ever said, there's joy in heaven over one person that receives the gift. No apostle ever said that. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth because everyone that repents receives the gift. Okay? Put it in perspective of the Scriptures. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, this is something she had that she lost. She lights a candle, she sweeps the house, and she seeks diligently till she find it. That's Jesus trying to get us to repent, to come back. And when she had found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels over the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Twice he gives us two parables and teaching us there's joy in heaven over a sinner that repents. Because that's the one that gets eternal life. That's the one that's going to go home. The ones that repent. Okay? 
So put it in perspective. Now, when we saw this over here in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, we were looking at the ideal of uh, that someone falling away and renewing the repentance. Okay? Let's just look at Luke 15, 7 through 10 and compare it to what Jesus said. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, either the woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one, say, you get the ideal. I found that piece which is lost. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. So when we look at this Hebrews 6, we see that he's teaching the same doctrine Jesus taught. If someone falls away, they're lost. And you know what? If, they, if, they renew, if their repentance is renewed, then they're back. And there's joy over heaven in heaven over one that, that repents. Okay? If falling away is to be lost. That's what that is. If you fall away, you're lost. You're not sealed forever if you fall away. You're not sealed forever if you're going to walk in darkness and be under the power of Satan and you're going to choose to walk disobedient before God. All the, all the apostles, especially Paul, they wrote of those that are children of disobedience. And he said, don't be deceived. They're not going to make it. It's in Ephesians, Galatians, it's in Colossians. What happens to children of disobedience? They walk after the flesh. If you want to be sealed forever, then you stay in a relationship with Jesus forever. I believe in eternal security as long as we're in a relationship with Him. Because He gave you free will and choice, you can walk out of that relationship anytime you want. And that's why Jesus talked to us about abide in us and I in you. It's a choice you have to abide in Him. And so we're just showing it's the same. Something that's lost is because it's fell away. You can fall away, and the way back is repentance. If there's repentance, there's joy in heaven over someone that repents. It's the same doctrine. A Christian that doesn't live a penitent lifestyle is an unfruitful garden. So when we go back to the book of Hebrews, we haven't read this yet, but he continues this thought uh, and, and, and gives us another metaphor of a garden, like John did. And so what he says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain and cometh oft upon it, Talking about the rain coming off upon it. It bringeth forth herbs and meat for them by whom it is dressed, and it receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars, see, that's, it, that's rejected. If a garden is become unfruitful and is full of thorns and briars, now that represents sin. And is, it's nigh to cursing because this is the curse and the sin is connected, right? And, it says, and he says, whose end is to be burned. The apostle writing the Hebrew letter is saying the same exact thing that John said. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree is not bringing forth good fruit. If it's an unfruitful garden, it's cast in the fire. Okay? That uh, he's going to, here, here's Jesus. He's, he says, John says, I baptize you water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, who is not under, worthy to unlatch or worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with, with fire. And he goes on to say, who's fanning in his hand, and he's going to. He will thoroughly purge his floor to make sure he gets all the chaff out. And he'll get the wheat to his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Whose end is to be burned? Is if, when a garden is fruitful, then, then it receives blessing from God. When it's unfruitful and full of briars and uh, thorns, it's going to be burned up. It's the same doctrine. It's not changed. Jesus didn't bring a whole new set of teaching different than what God told John. It's all the same. And by taking this, the, the beginning and going through to the end to show that it's never changed, you know, we can convince any reasonable person that this is the truth. But some people, you know, the Bible talks about people that just love a lie, doesn't it? That that's all in your letter? with all deceivableness and unrighteousness of those that love not the truth, that God will send them strong delusion because they love not the truth, believe the lie, and that all will be damned who love not the truth. All that's in the Thessalonian letter, right? Some people just don't want to know the truth. They want something else. What the Scriptures do and do not teach. Okay, in Luke 15, verse 7 through 10, we saw, he says, I say unto you likewise, there will be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Either woman having ten pieces of silver. And we, we read these, this, this parable already. And we read what he said here. Likewise, I say unto you, there will be joy in heaven 
in the presence of the angels, the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now what, what do we have over here throughout the book of Acts? What do we have? In Acts 5.31, Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You see that? What Jesus came and died upon the cross was, was far was to, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. He didn't come just to give them forgiveness, but to bring them to repentance. That's the Jews. In Acts 11, verse 18, And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then God hath also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So this is when Peter went and preached to the Gentiles. And then they all had a meeting over it and decided it was okay. And that they, they, that they come to the conclusion that God had granted to the Gentiles, like He did to Israel, repentance unto life. This is just the way it's portrayed to us. They brought the Jews to repentance first, the Gentiles to repentance second. And this repentance was unto life. This repentance was unto the forgiveness of sins. It was the same to both of them. This is the gift of eternal life that we've been talking about. If you want the gift of eternal life, you're going to get it through repentance. Just like it says right there. That's how you're going to get it. In chapter 20, verse 20 and 21, And how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying, Paul is saying he was testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, that's the Jews and the Gentiles, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That was his message. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That was his message. So when we look through what the apostles preached in the book of Acts, none of them said, receive the gift, be sealed forever. Nobody said that. They all said repent. They all said the message was to bring them to repentance and to give them forgiveness of sins. That's what they all said. Repentance and faith. Repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and life. Okay? You know what's common about all these messages? They all said repentance. Okay? They used different ways to describe the result of that repentance. But uh, repentance is the same. It's, it was the message. Well, that's all I'm going to share with you today. I'll turn it back over to the brother in charge.